In this lesson, we're going to take a look at section 6.2, which is the natural base E. On your calculator, you've probably seen the lowercase e with, that's in italics. And that is this function that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what exactly is E? Well, the natural base E, think of it as uh, an irrational number, similar to pi as like I have right here in the notes. Um, when you think of pi, you don't think of it as, you. I guess you know it as a symbol, but you equate that symbol to a number, and hopefully at this point, you say it's 3.14. Well, that's pretty much the same thing when you see the letter E. E is approximately 2.718. And so when you see that uh, letter E, that's pretty much what it represents. So as we take a look at our core concept right here, the natural base E is irrational. Once again, uh, if it's irrational, uh, it's going to be uh, a number that you can't turn into a fraction. So something like pi 3.1418, like there's no, you can't turn that into a, a fraction. Therefore, it is irrational. Uh, the same goes with this number right here for E. Uh, and as it says, Right here, as x approaches uh, to positive infinity, uh, 1 plus 1 over x to the x power approaches this number e, this magical letter that happens to be 2.718. So what we're going to take a look primarily today is, well, what do these functions with natural base e look like? So there's a few things to really pay close attention to when you when we look at this function the first off one we have our function here y is equal to a times e raised to the r x power okay so instead of the term b that we had before it was like a b to the x power we substitute b with this number or letter e and therefore when we take a look at the two graphs right there uh, the things i want you to pay attention i've highlighted uh, in order for you to get this exponential growth function right here in order for you to get that the a value needs to be greater than zero and the r value must also be greater than zero and then you'd have yourself your exponential growth. We get exponential decay when A is still greater than zero right here, but our value of R is less than zero. And then you have exponential decay with natural base of E. All right, so in both examples in or in both exponential growth and decay a is going to be greater than zero it's your value of r which will determine whether it's growth or decay right here next up we've got continuously compounded interest and so we have another equation for you to memorize it's when interest is compounded continuously. Uh, the amount A in an account after T years is given by the formula. A is equal to PE raised to the R times T or PERT. So P is principal, E is our, our number, and we have rate times time, okay? And there you go. And don't forget annual interest rate expressed as a decimal that right there is absolutely important to getting this problem correct or you'll be in bad or it'll be bad news for you all right so let's take a look at some practice examples here and we're going to start off by simplifying expressions so we simplify the expression as long as the we looked at all this stuff in chapter five, as long as the bases are the same, you could add, subtract, multiply, divide these exponents. 
but they have to have the same bases. Well, right here on number one, we have e to the negative nine power times e to the uh, 12th power. And so when you're multiplying and the bases are the same, don't forget you are going to be adding the powers together. So I have right here e to the negative ninth plus 12. And so go ahead, write that down, and then we can get our answer. Negative 9 plus 12 happens to be 3. So this right here ends up equaling e to the third power in number 1. Okay. Taking a look at number 2. So on number two, we've got, we're dividing. And so hopefully remember when we are uh, dividing exponents, we go ahead and subtract the powers. Uh, that 12 or 25 over 35 right here, I could simplify that just like any old fraction. Uh, we could divide top and bottom by five. And so I'll end up with five over seven. And with the ease, we got ourselves e to the 2 minus 7 power. So if we go ahead and put all of that together, 2 minus uh, 7 happens to be negative 5. Uh, remember, we do not want negative exponents, so we'll take the inverse of that. And so, remember, that's negative 5. So let's go ahead and rewrite this as 5 over 7 uh, to the e, 7 times e to the 5th power. So like that, that right there will be our answer for this question. Okay, so remember, we do not and will not have right here um, negative exponents. So that 2 minus 7 ends up equaling negative 5. And then when we go ahead and uh, we'll bring it down to our denominator, the exponent, instead of being negative, will now be positive and you'll end up with five over seven e to the fifth power. Let's go ahead and take a look at number three next. All right, so let's go ahead and take that exponent of uh, the fifth power and let's make sure we go ahead and oh, it's almost like distributing but we got to take it to all the terms here so we have right here two to the fifth power is what we got to um, think about first and so when we take two to the fifth power that ends up getting us 32. and then from there we raise a power to a power uh, with the negative three x to the fifth and that will get us, when we raise a power to a power, you go ahead and multiply, and therefore we'll have negative 15x. And then we still have this times 2e to the x plus 1 power. Now if I look at this, I can't really do anything Uh, I can't do anything with these exponents because my bases aren't the same. But can I do something where the bases are the same? Well, let's think about the, the base of 2. Since the term on the right has a 2e, then maybe with that 32, hey, I can get a 2 as well. How about this? I'll take this 32 I and mean, let's give it a base of 2. And if I raise that to the fifth power, isn't that 32 right there? It sure is. So let me go ahead and take the 32. I'll rewrite that as uh, 2 to the fifth. And then we have right here e to the negative 15x power. I can go ahead and do that. Or, actually, since I'm not adding this, I can actually go back a step. Let's go ahead and multiply this out. I can multiply the 32 and the 2 together. 
All right, so I multiply the 32 and the 2, I end up with 64. I look at the bases, I can go ahead and multiply them together, and then what do I do? I add the exponents now. And so negative 15x plus x, that'll get me negative 14. I got negative 14x plus 1, and that right there is our solution. Go ahead and disregard what I just kind of told you uh, a little while ago, or just a moment ago. Next up, on number four. I've got the fourth root of 16e raised to the 24x power. And so at that point, you know, we can always take a radical and turn it into a fraction. So that could possibly be a lot easier for you to understand, all right, what are the steps that we're taking in this problem? So I'm going to go ahead right here. Let me take the fourth root and turn that into the one fourth power. And let's rewrite this as 16 E to the 24 X. And I'll raise that to the one fourth power. So Remember, when I raise a power to a power, I can multiply them. But what about that 16? You got to remember, hey, I could possibly take the fourth root of 16. Uh, we could also do it without a calculator and rewrite this 16 as 2 to the fourth power. So if I rewrite it as 2 to the fourth power, then, hey, maybe when I, I take 4 and raise that to the 1 fourth power, I multiply and then that becomes 1. So that becomes 2 to the first power or just 2 by itself. So that's the thought process of what I'm doing right here. So I now have uh, 2 to the fourth, but when I raise that to the 1 fourth power right here, that ends up becoming 1. So I'm left with 2 to the first or just 2. And then with E raised to 24x, uh, and I multiply that by one fourth, then I'll be left with e to the six x power. And we now have simplified. Remember, most of the steps that I'm taking here, or pretty much all of them, it's things that you did in chapter five. So being able to add, subtract, multiply, divide exponents, it was all from chapter five. So if you need to go back, since I know we kind of had a little break, you know, we had our winter break right here, uh, you may have forgotten some of those steps and therefore uh, it's good, a good idea to review all of that. All right, next, let's take a look at these graphs. Let's see if we can graph these functions. Uh, let's see if we could even figure out what they look like even before graphing. So if we take a look at number five right here, I've got y is equal to 2e to the negative x power. And remember, things that I need to look out for, okay? On these problems, the big things that I need to look for is a. Is the a positive or negative? Well, the A typically will be positive in these problems. But is the A positive or negative? Is the R value same thing, positive or negative? Because that will determine whether we have exponential growth or decay. If the, in both of the examples, when we take a look 
um, or in the core concept, in the parent functions, it was the A term was positive. So if the A term was positive, it was, it would be either growth or decay. That was in both of the scenarios. However, it's that R term. If that was negative, then it would be decay. If the R term was positive, it would be growth. Right here, if I take a look at this negative X, we can go ahead and say that R is actually equal to negative one. If that part that's in front of the, um, in front of the X. So R is negative, A is positive. What that tells me right here is we've got ourselves exponential growth. Let's see what our function should look like. Let's go ahead and go over here to Desmos. And lo and behold, I've got that function right here. And we've got ourselves uh, decay. I am sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Because our R value is negative, we do have ourselves exponential decay. I don't know why, why I thought the opposite. I said all the right things, I just didn't give the right answer. And it happens. A lot of things going on right now. Uh, so we got, there you go. All right. Good thing I showed the graph or else I might have, I would have got that, gave you some misinformation there. Uh, looking at number six, A right here is positive. It's 0.75, but it doesn't matter if it's greater than or less than one. Uh, our, our term right here is also positive, right? We got four. So in this time around, uh, we do have ourselves growth. And that I am pretty certain of. So we go ahead over here. Let's show what it looks like on Desmos. And it's going to go upwards. And there you have it. Okay. Phew. Taking a look next up at number seven. Okay. A is positive. It's five. B is, or sorry, R is also positive. So R is positive. So once again, we've got growth. Okay. Going upwards. Give you a quick peek over here. And in that purple function, you could see it going upwards and it is growing. Hopefully you realize, remember that A value is like your uh, stretch and shrink. Think of it kind of like that. So you can see the difference between six and seven right there. Um, on what, what you're seeing with the, how the function is behaving. Uh, next up, let's go ahead and take a look at number eight. And once again, we look right here, your A is positive. Your R right here is negative. It's negative three. So right here, we end up with DK. And just to show that to you again right here, we have our fourth function. Let's take a look at that graph, and it is going downwards. All right, things look good right here. Next up. Let's take a look at number nine. So we're going to use a table or a graphing calculator uh, to graph the function. You should be able to use a, do this without a graphing calculator. All right. 
Uh, that is the whole idea behind what we're taking a look at right here in number nine. So how do we do it? It should be pretty straightforward. Um, you're going to have to pick, pick numbers in a table. Now think about this. You take a look at the e to the x power minus 4. And hopefully thinking about all the transformations that we've covered, um, you know, in, in the first five chapters here, uh, that minus 4 it happens to be part of the output, and that will be what will affect the vertical shift. Okay, so if it's e to the x power minus 4, remember, in the parent function, so let's think about this. The parent function happens to be at e to the x power. So let's go ahead and put that down right here. y is equal to e to the x power. And so let's take a look over here at Desmos. This is what I'm trying to show you. And when it's e to the x power, we know that in the parent function, it's going to cross right here at 0, 1. Okay. So if it's going to be shifting down 4 units, well, how far down does it go specifically? Let's go ahead and show that function right here in red. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is look where this crosses the x-axis. It's here at 0, negative 3. Okay? It's not at 0, negative 4. So that's the important thing to realize in this problem. It's Yes, it is being shifted down 4 units, but it's not 4 units from 0, 0. It's four units from where it crosses that X or Y axis from right here at zero, one, and then moving down four units, okay? So that is the key thing right here. Because it is, you know, going to intersect right here at, uh, at the Y axis, what I'm gonna go ahead and, when I choose my points right here, I can go ahead and choose points like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I can do all that. Okay? So we're going to go ahead. We've got those points. We'll start plugging things in to find what our values are. All right. And so we'll start off an easy one. We've got e to the zero power, and remember, when we have something raised to the zero power, it ends up equaling one, right? So then, next up, we've got e to the first power, which is, you know, our, our number of 2.7. So let's go ahead and put e to the first, and then minus four, we end up with negative 1.28. We have, next up, e to the raised to the second power and then minus four I've got three point uh, three eight or looks like it's probably three point four right there let's go ahead and change that to three point four let's put up next e to the negative first power And then minus 4, we've got negative 3.63. And then e to the negative second power, minus 4. And we have negative 3.86. Okay. So we have all these parts right here.
Don't know why it's doing that. I'll go ahead and draw an axis. So with the function, remember at 0, 1, or sorry, that's not, remember that's uh, 1 minus 4. One of our points should be at negative 3 right here, at 0, negative 3. We have uh, at 1, we're at negative 1.28. At 2, we're at 3.4. We'll say it's up there. At negative 1, we're at negative 3.63. At negative 2, we're at negative 2, uh, 3.86. And so hopefully you realize now that as I go ahead and connect my dots, you can see where the function exists. And we saw it earlier in Desmos. But now we've got to figure out, well, what's my domain and range? Remember, as you see right here at these numbers, it's going to get close to negative 4. But it's not going to cross there. So what that tells me is that negative 4 right here is my asymptote. Domain is easy, right? Domain is all real. It's all real numbers because remember it's going to expand left and right but for my range however that's a little bit different my range is going to be where that asymptote is and everything above that so for my range y is going to be greater than negative four and there is your function all right, so it's important to know uh, how the functions uh, transform, okay, based off of just looking at the equation. If I take a look at number the equation on number 10, y is equal to 2 times e raised to the x plus 3. That x plus 3 right there, remember that 3 is playing around with that input. That's going to give me my horizontal shift. Okay, so on that one, you're going to see it's horizontal. We take the opposite of it. Instead of going three units to the right, it's actually going to go three units to the left. Let's see what it looks like. So if I know that it's going to go three units to the left, when I create my table right here, Instead of choosing negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, all right, I want to go ahead and start in the middle being negative 3. And then let's choose negative 4, negative 5, negative 2, and negative 1. And then we'd be able to get a better idea of where my function or what my function should look like. If I go ahead, Let's take a look over here on Desmos. Got my parent function right there. And then let's go ahead and show the function shifted. And you can see, once again, where some of these critical points are. All right. Now it's not going to be. It's, so you see it shifted over to the left right here. Looking at the function. And then from there, it's also being stretched out. And so if you look at negative 3, 1, there's no point there. It's all the way up at negative 3, 2. All right. But it shows you that there is a shift happening. Okay. Now, 
in all of our examples right here, we've looked at where the A term is positive and we've had exponential growth and exponential decay. If we look at example number 11 right here, that A value actually isn't positive, it's negative. So what does that do to the function? Let's take a look right here. The function for number 11 happens to be negative e to the x power. And you could see right here, hey, this function is now going downwards like this, as opposed to exponential decay, which would be like so. So you could see the difference on now what happens to your function when it um, when the a term is negative essentially we could say what it reflected okay it reflected like around x and there you have that right there all right let's go ahead and go back over and take a look now at number 12. So this is where we use our equation that we had. A is equal to P-E-R-T. P times E raised to the R times T. And so it says the population of Evans City is currently 48,500 and is declining. All right, so I'll take a look. 48,500 seems pretty darn important. Rate is a percentage each year. And then you can model the population of Evans City by the equation P sub T is equal to P sub C, which is the current population times uh, E raised to the RT power. Uh, P sub T is the population of T years and R is the decimal rate, okay? If you look, it doesn't look like a decimal point. It says 2.5%. So that is definitely not a decimal. We're going to have to change that into a decimal. And it says predict the population of Evans City after 25 years. All right, let's see where we can plug a few things in here. Uh, there is one key thing that I see that I haven't mentioned. It's up in that first sentence. Declining. Exponential growth, exponential decay. Decline would be similar to that of decay. So we do need to realize that there is this term called of declining and somehow use that in our function. All right, so we have P sub C is 48,500. Uh, so we can plug that in. We have right here, so we're gonna to try to find P sub T. I got 48,500 is P sub C. E does not change, right? That is always going to stay the same. E is E. And then we have R raised to the R times T. Let's take that 2.25, or sorry, let's take that 0.25% right there and turn that into a decimal. So 0 0.025, that will be your rate. And then we have T, that'll be 25. So let's, we plugged all that stuff in, and then let's go ahead and plug in the point, raised to the point 0 0.025, and then times 25. And remember, there is that one absolutely critical thing that I said that we had to add here. It's that word declining, and where does that go? It's going to go next to that point 0 0.025. All right, so make sure that when you plug in all these 
all your information into the equation. We've got P sub T is equal to 48,500 times E. And then we have right here our rate, which is 0 0.25. So we're going to raise that to the negative 0 0.25 and then times 25 for your time. So I'll go ahead and give you a moment. Go ahead and try um, plugging that stuff into your calculator and see what you get when they try to predict population at Evans City after 25 years. And if you were to get 25,960 as a population, good job. You had plugged everything in correctly into your calculator. All right, so it makes sense because remember, it's the population is declining. So your total for population should be less than what it originally was at 48,500. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the last problem that we see here which happens to be number 13. It says your parents will need $25,000 in 10 years to pay for your brother's college tuition. They can invest in an account with an interest rate of 9.8%. Let's go ahead, I'll already take this 9.8%, change that to 0 0.098. And it compounds continuously. And then how much should your parents invest today in order to have your brother's full tuition available in 10 years? So time would be 10 years and your parents need 25,000. So what we're trying to figure out is, look, we know what their goal is. The goal is 25,000. What we need to figure out is, well, P, which would end up being your principal. So let's figure out what principal is. Let's see where could I plug in these other these other numbers that we have here. So that 25,000 typically is how much we want in the account or is what we're usually looking for. But this time They give us what we want, and that's 25,000. So I'll put that in for uh, A. That right there is going to be equal to P, the principal, which is the initial amount, which we do not know. And then we have E, since we're talking about continuous uh, compounding, we use E, and then the rate of 0. Point or 0 0.098, and then we raise that to the T power, which happens to be times 10. So now we have all of the numbers put together. And from there, let's go ahead and solve for P. So in order for us to solve for P right here, we're going to have to divide both sides by the same thing. And so let's go ahead 
and get p by itself. Remember, it's p times e raised to the 0 0.98 times 10. So what that allows us to do is go ahead and divide both sides by that value of e right here. And from there, we're going to go ahead, divide both sides by e uh, to the 0 0.9, times 10 to both sides. And carefully with your calculator, you should be able to find the pop or how much uh, principal uh, this, uh, these parents need to uh, start off with in order to reach their goal of 25,000. That magic number right here, after you put everything together, it will be 9,382 dollars and 78 cents. All right, so once again, kind of recapping this problem, it's a little bit different because they gave us the amount that we need. We already know how much we need, but we're trying to find as the principal. What do we start with? And so we go ahead and solve for P right here. And there is your number. They start off with $9,382.78. In, what is it, 10 years, the parents will be able to get $25,000. Based on the interest rate being 9.8%. That's pretty ridiculously high. Uh, if you can find something that's 9.8%, you are you hit the jackpot. All right. There you go. Section 6.2.